Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michi Yukawa, one of the organizers for the Geriatrics uh, Grand Round. It is my absolute pleasure and delight to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Lee Lindquist. She is the Chief of Geriatrics and Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine and Geriatrics at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. She is also the lead geriatrician for the Leadership Corps and Research Mentoring Corps for the Northwestern University Carl Pepper Older American Independent Center. Her health service research focuses on patient-centered research that helps older adults to age in place and decision-making about long-term care services. Dr. Lindquist has received numerous awards, including Outstanding Inpatient Medicine Teacher, Outstanding Geriatric Teachers of the Year, and Aging and In-Home Services Lifetime Award of Excellence. She is on the editorial board of the Journal of General Internal Medicine, and she and I serve on the Geriatric Commissions of the Society of General Internal Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lindquist. She's going to talk to us about aging in place, planning for the next event. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Yukawa. This has been such a great day getting to literally hang out with my good friends um, at UCSF and meet some new good friends. Um, and so today I get to talk about aging in place, planning for Nexus events. Um, feel free to hang or to DM me during Twitter with Twitter or email me. Uh, I'm usually pretty happy. This is Chicago. It's a beautiful place, except in the wintertime when it's cold. Um, but like Mishi says, I'm chief of geriatrics. I've got two kids. Um, I've got a lot of research funding, and we were having fun talking about this in the fellowship uh, group, is that my first research out of uh, fellowship, I compared living on a cruise ship with living in assisted living, um, and that garnered about 144 million hits. Um, so I always tell my fellows, what you do in your fellowship, it can definitely uh, make an impact on the world. Um, and that's where I come to what is my glorious purpose in life. And my glorious purpose is aging in place. Um, for me too, I want to age in place. I'm sure a lot of people in the room want to age in place, wherever that might be. Um, but these are my grandparents. Um, I start every talk with them because they're the reason I went into geriatrics. Um, my mom had, or my grandmother had bad osteoarthritis um, and she was mostly wheelchair bound. And my grandfather had severe Alzheimer's. So um, he was the body of the operation and she was the brains of the operation. Um, but they both started to, to deteriorate and they lived in rural Wisconsin. So um, right after my fellowship, we moved them into my two bedroom apartment um, in Chicago, which they were not happy with me, but it made me realize how important um, and what the story that caregivers have to go through um, in order to help their older adults. Um, and so they're the reason for my season, at least. Um, and when we talk about aging in place, um, I loved Loki. I don't know if anyone else in the room saw Loki, uh, Disney Plus, awesome show, uh, but it totally made me think about my seniors. And so Loki, um, we all know him as Thor's brother. He's the villain usually. Um, and as part of this uh, series on Disney Plus, um, they have him yanked out of the uh, of a, one of the events, and it shows that he's on a timeline, but that there's variants that come off of this timeline, and so he goes after variants of himself off of this timeline, um, and that made me think what exactly is a nexus event for our older adults? So what makes our seniors on their normal timeline fall off, become a variant? So when you think about what are the nexus events, you know, when they're hospitalized, that throws everything off. When they fall um, or when they develop Alzheimer's disease. So it's not even a case of if for many of these um, older adults, it's more of a idea of when, when are you gonna be hospitalized? Um, and so my train of thought is let's plan for your next nexus event, um, e.g. a hospitalization prior to ever getting hospitalized. And so we have an interdisciplinary team. I always love working with a bunch of happy people. Um, my moniker is that if you would enjoy drinking a beer with somebody, then I would love to have you on my team. 
Um, I think it's a good litmus. You can also drink wine um, or a good Pepsi, but if I wanna hang out with you, then I'd love to do research with you. Um, and so this is our interdisciplinary team. We had geriatricians, social workers, um, area agency and aging leaders, nurses. Um, and what was great is that I actually received funding. Um, so I received three awards from PCORI and an additional R01 from the NIA um, to kind of work on this planning ahead. And so and with our big interdisciplinary team, we created planyourlifespan.org. Um, and what it is, is that it teaches people to plan for their fourth quarter um, because we know people are living longer, um, but it's not for the end of life, it's for the years before. So what rehab options are available after hospitalization? Um, how do you connect to local services? What steps can you do to prevent falls? Um, and so this kind of teaches people what they need to know and what they need to think ahead of when they need more support in the future. So it breaks down to hospitalizations, falls, memory loss, talking to others and finances. And it usually starts with a video of a senior. Um, I was talking to Dr. Sidori because we had to reshoot a lot of our videos. Um, so they're still being inputted, uh, but it's a constant thing is having to update our websites. Uh, she's got the prepare your care. We've got plan your lifespan. Um, so it's a, a continuation of life. Um, but what plan your lifespan does is it discusses what outpatient physical therapy is, you know, what's home-based physical therapy. What's the difference between going to a rehab facility versus a subacute rehab facility. I mean, we use the term sniff so often that when you talk to a patient and you accidentally use the word sniff, they're like, what do you mean by that? So it teaches them actually what is a subacute rehab, what's a sniff. And I always love it because when I teach my patients these, these nicknames, the, when they get hospitalized, they'll say things like, I know what sniff I want to go to. And it'll floor the residents and the med students. They're like, oh, you're a Lindquist patient. It's like, yes. Um, so I, we try to teach them you know, what the different languages are. Um, and we also direct them to medicare.gov to see, you can actually look at the different nursing homes that are in your area and kind of have an idea before you ever need one. Um, it also goes along to say, am I prepared to return home? Oops. Um, am I prepared to return home? Um, and then it goes through things like, oops. There we go. Oh, I flew. So it goes through different things um, such as, am I prepared to go home? Um, but the other things that are useful is that talking to others. What we found is that many times people will make plans, but they won't communicate it to their loved ones, which is super critical, um, especially because many times these people will be planning or um, actually implementing these ideas. And I apologize. I think my screen might be coming in and out. Um, and then finances. A big um, misconception that we've seen has been that uh, people think Medicare pays for everything, which we know it doesn't. So people have to think about um, how they're gonna afford their wishes down the road. And then um, it goes with a summary slide where it, you can actually email um, your loved ones um, the summary or you can print it out yourself. So with our PCORI funding, we actually did a randomized control trial of about 400 seniors and it showed that it improved hospital discharge knowledge, communication, and planning. Um, and this was over a three month period where we randomized seniors into a control group and an intervention group. Um, and we also did this looking at the Alzheimer's um, as well as falls. Um, and so it's publicly available. Anyone can use it anytime, um, no ads. Um, and so after we built it, after we tested it, we actually got funding from PCORI to do further dissemination. So we did a train the trainer approach where we had our original trainers. Um, and this is Chris Fercucci, who is an aging in place um, uh, area agency nurse um, out in rural Indiana. And she went to teach um, a lovely person who's a community leader um, who used to live in Chicago. And then she went on to teach her friends all about it. Um, and they would engage new community partners. So it was literally an exponential growth. And so what we had the trainees do was log their dissemination activities, um, the audience and the attendance and the date. And the trainees were located in Illinois, Indiana, and Hawaii. And I love, love, love our Hawaii partners. They're phenomenal. 
I love the Indiana partner too, but when it's cold in Chicago and you have to do a research trip and it's in Hawaii, it's so much better. Um, and so our community partners were a nurse leader. We had a social worker serving the Hawaiian islands. Um, and then we also had older adult patients who were active in the community. And so what was interesting is that we actually said, here's this website, um, you know, here's an ideas of what you might want to do as far as, you know, how do you talk about it? You know, here's a PowerPoint that we've used in the past. And so what we found was that actually community leaders embedded plan your lifespan into their welcome to Medicare and annual Medicare visits. So they actually put it as a part of their annual visits. Um, the case managers at area agencies on aging referred clients to plan your lifespan as a resource. And then some of our seniors actually had coffee talks or senior cafes, as well as walking groups. And I'm sorry about the screen. We are having a rain, um, some rain here. So I hope that's not the cause. Um, and then as far as um, using Google Analytics, we actually tracked accounts by state, um, logged in web sessions and daily websites uh, during the dissemination period. So when a, uh, when a community partner or one of the new trainees would actually have a dissemination event, we would look at the activity one week after and then the activity one month after. And so what we were really excited about was that on the same day as some of these uh, dissemination activities, whether it was the walking group or a cafe, um, there was 89,562 web visits. And this was after the period. And then one month, we actually had 300,000 logged in sessions. Um, and it was interesting because we had such spread because only about one fourth of the new accounts were in the activity state. And when we were talking to some of our caregiver partners and some of our patient partners, they actually said, well, yeah, I told so-and-so who then called their sister in Alaska, um, who then called their you know, aunt in Georgia. Um, so what we saw was a very wide spread um, among our trainers of how stuff got disseminated. And so we actually mapped out how some of this dissemination was occurring. Um, and we had caregivers and older adults, which were doing a lot of community presentations and passing out print materials and flyers. Um, we had clinicians and healthcare professionals um, who were trying to put things into annual wellness visits. Um, I got to do a lovely Jerry Pal podcast. So thank you very much to the UCSF crew uh, for letting me uh, be in a part of their podcasts. Um, and then we had other patient partners and community stakeholders that used a web-based toolkit. Um, the most, uh, well, one of the most interesting things for me was the Epic MyChart integration. And so after, as we were doing our dissemination, um, I got a phone call from Verona, Wisconsin. Epic uh, National reached out to us and asked if they could link to Plan Your Lifespan uh, from the patient MyChart pages. And so... Uh, it was a great opportunity for us. And so if any of your patients go on to my chart, it's national. Um, they can actually go on the patient pages and click plan your lifespan as a resource. So when you think about your research, um, and this always, I talk to my mentees about this, my junior investigators, I say, listen, you know, whatever project you do, you have to think about the dissemination early on. How is it going to be able to spread? Um, and what we were able to show is that our dissemination, we had over 300,000 hits um, to plan your lifespan in six months. And then we geomapped it. Um, and it was amazing that we even got to other countries, um, South Africa, Russia, um, you know, Southern America, South America, Australia. Um, so it was quite phenomenal to see how plan your lifespan spread. And so what would be the next steps? Um, what's the next iteration? What are the next variants um, to plan your lifespan? Um, and so we were actually lucky enough um, to get further R01 funding. Um, where we, what we were thinking about was, you know, how do you prune the timeline branches? What leads people to variant from aging in place timeline? So if you experience a nexus event, can you return back? Or can you even just stop that nexus event? How do you stay on your timeline? How do you prune those branches? And can plan your lifespan help return you to your home? And so this is a current project that we're working on. Um, and we're looking at what are the potential moderators and mediators to aging in place and long-term care outcomes. So, you know, is it that they have more social support? 
you know, and somebody's enabling, enabling them to stay at home? Or is it that there's more social support, so they're concerned, so they're being moved out? Um, and we don't know that yet. There's so many different um, variations as far as decision-making, implementation, and goal concordance. And so um, with our timeline, uh, we actually started our baseline testing about three months before COVID struck, uh, which was exciting. I'm sure you guys all felt the same way when you guys were doing your research. And so in the middle of our longitudinal study, we had to convert over to doing virtual. And then we've had a good chunk of time where people have been heavily influenced by COVID um, because our testing has been one month, three months, six months, 12 months, 18 months. Um, and we're following these subjects for 42 months. So what we're doing is we're taking patients um, in a LitCog cohort, which is a cohort that we have here in Chicago. And we are following them. We're actually showing them plan your lifespan and then we're following them for 42 months. Um, and we're doing extensive testing uh, with intensive cognition testing and testing all those other mediators. So what's fascinating to me is that we're getting some preliminary findings um, that there's changes in self-efficacy uh, for managing social interactions. So what do you mean by that? I mean, the seniors are saying, listen, I made it through COVID, so I can do everything I need to interact at home. I am having so much more self-efficacy. And we're seeing that even as a trend and with some significance. And so the earliest findings we have is down below. And we've had, I mean, we've completed the baselines. This was before it. Um, we've also seen some changing views about long-term care. So you can imagine people were open to it before when we were doing our baseline testing. In the midst of COVID, people hated it. And then they really hated it. But then now as we're creeping out, um, we're about a year and a half starting and people are like, you know, I'm open to it. Things have got better. Um, if I needed it, I would think about going there. And that's the other thing too, is this decision-making. When I think of decision-making, I think of the timeline, here's the nexus, or here's where we make our timeline changes. And I had a great discussion with Dr. Sidori where she said, think about it more as a circle. Because what we're seeing is that people are contemplating, I'm gonna think about doing it. And then I've decided that this is what I wanna do, but then wait a minute, oh, there's been a lot more changes in the world around me. So I'm gonna think about it some more. Um, and we've also had to deal with challenges with what actually constitutes a long-term care decision or a plan implementation. So people are telling us that they've made decisions, but the problem is that they've made a decision and their decision is, you love this one, you guys, their decision is they've decided to stay at home until they die in their bed alone. And I'm like, no, that's not the, that's not a decision. That's not a decision when you need more support to stay at home until you die. I'm like, that is a non-decision. Um, so we have to go through and kind of help people to figure out what is actually a non-decision versus a decision. Um, and so what we are seeing too is that people are very resistant to implementing their plans. They've made, they've contemplated it, they've made some decisions, but then people are not even thinking that they're ready to implement plans when they might be. Um, because as a clinician, I'm a geriatrician, I say, you know, hey, patient, I, you need to implement these plans. And many times the older adult will say, nope, not going to do it. I'm not even going to think about it. I'm not doing it. Nope, nope, nope. And that floors me. That floors my med students and my residents and my fellows too, because think about it, you know, when you're under 65 or if you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and I said, I'm going to send somebody to your house to do your laundry, make meals for you and drive you around. You'd be like, yes, please, you know. Um, but when people get older, we all know this, they are resistant to help because it implies that they're less independent, that they can't do it. Um, and so this is where it's kind of a hitch. So what do you do? How do you get people to implement their plans? And so I have an MBA from, North, from Northwestern's Kellogg um, School of Business. And what we know is that business schools have trained executives on negotiation and dispute resolution for years. And so my MBA is in negotiations with marketing. And I thought, you know what, let's try teaching family caregivers of older adults how to negotiate using business school tactics, right? Who would love to teach that? Who would love to know how to negotiate more, right? Everybody. Um, and so if you think about conflict, and I love using the scale. So with conflict, um, we react to conflict so differently. Um, there's people in your lives that are assertive, which is up here. Um, there's people in your lives that are less assertive, very unassertive. 
Um, and on the other side, on the x-axis, you've got people who are very cooperative, and then you've got others who are uncooperative. So you can think about where you yourself would lie on this, and even think about where your loved ones would lie. Um, and ideally, you don't want to be in the blue circle, which is the avoiding. You don't want to be in the red circle, and you don't really want to be in the green circle. You want to be more compromising and collaborating. Um, and so that's kind of the best way to deal with conflict. Um, but unfortunately, many of us in the medical field either are avoiding things where we don't want to call back that patient because they're going to yell at us all the time, or we're accommodating. We say, yeah, 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 sure. You don't have to move anytime soon. You're fine. Um, and so the scale to the right is a common scale that business uh, schools use to detect what your level of conflict behaviors are. Um, and so these are questions that get asked as far as yielding, compromising, forcing, problem solving, um, and avoiding. So this is called the Dutch. So before we started tackling the caregivers, um, I went after the people around me. So uh, I decided with another hospitalist to try to train the hospitalists um, in negotiations to address their conflicts with older adults. What we were seeing is that a lot of patients will be sent home from the hospital without support uh, because they're refusing it. And then they'll just come right back, you know, because they're, they're failing at home. They did need the support, but then they didn't get it. They refuse it. They come back. So we sometimes will see this evil cycle of frequent flyers coming around. Um, and so this is one of the um, interesting findings is that we did a one hour class in person with the hospitalists, teaching them these negotiation tactics and then having them do an exercise. Um, and at baseline versus one month, we tested how they were with yielding and compromising, forcing, problem solving, et cetera. Um, and what you saw is that there is some movement. Um, people were less compromising, people were less yielding, um, they were less for forcing, um, but they started to trend up with problem solving. So that's a good thing. And what was really interesting for us too is that comparing baseline to one month, um, the hospitalists felt that they had more self-efficacy in dealing with conflict even outside of the hospital. So we had mixed methods on this and it was great because the hospitals were saying, you know, I argued with my boyfriend and I won for the first time. Um, you know, I argued with my, you know, or I, I you know, had a negotiation with uh, my um, landlord and I was able to get, you know, $300 off my rent. Um, so they're using these skills with their patients. It's giving them more self-efficacy that they can deal with conflict. Um, and it's also impacting their lives. So because we like people, uh, we actually did it with our case managers. Um, and we did this at a national conference where we did a negotiation workshop with 85 social workers from 22 states. Um, and this was mostly a qualitative study. And so what we found is that most of the caregiver managers loved it. They thought that it would improve their care. Um, and we've also done it with the nurses. So we did it with 88 nurses. Um, overall, a lot of satisfaction about it. Um, and so when we started to talk about tackling the family caregivers, we had a good idea of what the conflicts were in the hospital um, with dealing with older adults, but we wanted to see what the conflicts that family caregivers experienced besides their older adult loved one, because we know that many times family caregivers have conflicts with their loved ones. Um, what was an overwhelming theme uh, was that family caregivers had a lot of conflicts with their providers. So you know, my general practitioner is hard to get a hold of. Um, it's frustrating because I can't even check in on the situation. They never call. Um, when I try to discuss what's going on with my dad or him, you know, they shut down the conversation. They don't take me seriously. Um, and I love this idea. One of the uh, one of the family caregivers says, "I have to be a helicopter advocate at times. Otherwise, there would have been some serious problems due to flaws in the healthcare system." So when we think about the caregivers are having conflicts with the older adult, but they're also having conflicts with providers and with the health system. So with our R01 funding, um, we thought teaching caregivers how to negotiate would be a great tool, uh, which would enable them to communicate with their loved ones, with healthcare staff, with insurance companies. Um, the thing was is that thinking ahead, we didn't wanna just do these in person like what we had been doing. So we connected with a group that's out of um, Central Florida that does 
um, an AI-based negotiation or AI-based negotiation gaming. Um, so they're game makers and they do a lot of emotional um, AI-based. So what does that mean? That means that um, you can actually negotiate against an avatar that will respond to your emotions. So it can actually read your emotions. And then as you're like, you know, getting upset, it'll actually have an avatar that will respond to you. Um, and then you can make, you know, negotiating for, you know, if it's a senior mom, you need help, mom, you need to stop driving. Um, and this is what we're anticipating. We're actually in the middle of the build right now. Um, we're in year one and the build is going to be that we've got these education tools. So people are gonna get some basics of um, uh, NDR, which is negotiation and dispute resolution. Um, we've got some tactics, troubleshooting. And since this slide was created, we've actually cut down everything to be four minutes long because none of the caregivers wanted to sit around for 15 minutes. So um, from our original uh, grant plan till um, today, pretty much, uh, we've cut it down a lot. Um, and then all of our family caregivers are going to get a basic negotiation where they get to go against an older adult who's refusing home support. Um, and then they're gonna be randomly assigned to one of three um, exercises where it's going to be a caregiver negotiating against a physician, a caregiver negotiating against another physician and a patient, so a multi-party negotiation, and then a distant negotiation, so an insurance issue and a caregiver. And so that one might actually be the trickiest one because the insurance um, agent has been programmed to say no. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. And so we're doing a multi-phase optimization strategy trial. And I love these trials. So if you haven't read up on them and you're interested in research, I would definitely look into this more. They're adaptive trials. Um, and so they can optimize your um, intervention um, and you can see which parts work best. And so the reason we're doing a most with this is because the entire curriculum or the entire negotiation curriculum um, would be over an hour. And so we wanted to see if we can cut it down or just do the stuff that's the most important. And so our caregivers are going to be assigned to one of eight experimental conditions. Um, and we're gonna be enrolling about 200 caregivers. So that'll be over the next five years. We're only in year one. And so that's my glorious purpose to plan ahead to age in place. Um, and so this is some of the things that I want my seniors. So when a senior enters the emergency department, I know that if I'm admitted, I may need subacute rehab and I have chosen three different facilities that I prefer. I mean, who would love their patients to say this when they come in the you know, ER or you know, if mom goes home, I have a home caregiver agency that she wishes to use for a caregiver and she's agreeable to it. So think about how easy that situation would be um, if we had the right conversations and so forth. Um, and I think a big thing is that we have to make sure that our research actually leads to change. Um, and so I'll just give you a quick one over on Northwestern Geriatrics. Um, we've created a very senior friendly health system. So when I started as chief years ago, um, there was only two geriatricians, so my colleague chose to be the geriatric fellowship director, and I got to be section chief, um, and there was a mass exodus of the old guard, um, and I think we lost maybe about six or seven geriatricians um, over like a couple of months, and so um, during that time, I also um, negotiated to be the executive director of senior services, which meant that I got to have influence over the health system. Um, and I was talking to the fellows earlier, it is so critical um, to actually have the ear of the health system um, so that they can make decisions that are senior friendly. Um, so what we did, it was two people. Um, and at the time we only had clinics um, and we barely had a nursing home. And since then we've developed a geriatric emergency department, an outpatient clinic, a home care program, um, as well as a fully functional preferred provider um, connect, uh, network. Um, this is my nursing home that I work at. It's a 51-story CCRC in downtown Chicago. So it is a vertical um, CCRC. And there's, I think there's only like a couple in the country. Assist, independent living is on the top. Then it's assisted living in the middle, then nursing home. And then you're out the door when you have to go to the hospital or um, to the funeral home. Morbid humor, I apologize. Um, but it's an, a unique setup for downtown Chicago. 
So our geriatric emergency department was originally funded through a CMS grant. Um, I was the lead geriatrician. Um, we had a couple of ED docs on it. Um, and what we did is that we had geriatric trained nurse liaisons, called them JEDIs. Um, and they actually would see the patients in the ED and then try to get them sent home. I think you guys out here in UCSF have a similar thing started. Um, and then we've trained other groups across the country with JEDI. Um, another thing is that we started a home care program. Um, and so this is Dwayne Dobschutz, my nurse practitioner, uh, who is a full-time nurse practitioner in the home care program. Um, we travel around on purple bikes. Um, that was one of the things that I got from Northwestern that we negotiated for. Um, so we have a fleet of purple bikes that we can ride around in, which are lovely because then the med students can jump on a bike um, and go around. Um, just a special sentence for Dwayne. Dwayne um, is 70 and he might be 69. And so he was one of the original Jedi nurses, loved geriatrics, had been working in the ED for about 30 years. And then he decided to go back to nurse practitioner school when he was 65. And so then I hired him for his first job out of his NP school as a geriatric nurse practitioner um, who was in the home care program. And so he has been integral in kind of what goes in our bag. So our gear bag weighs less than eight pounds and we do a lot of micro technology, which is like the EKG machine fits on the phone. Um, we've got our, you know, otoscope that fits on the phone. Um, everything is micro sized. Um, and then we receive referrals from our ED appointments or from the um, JEDI program. Um, the JEDIs in the emergency department will see patients and then they want to send them home and then they'll contact our home care program to see them and follow up, um, usually within one or two days. Um, and then if they do get admitted, we can sometimes follow them through admission and then perform a hospital post-hospital home visit. And what we've shown is the reduction in hospitalizations as well as decreased readmissions with the largest impact on high utilizer seniors. So instead of seniors coming to ED, they're calling our home care program. Um, and then this is our, our skilled nursing facility, which I spoke about earlier. Um, what's great is that our Northwestern geriatricians are in each of our skilled nursing facilities that are in our direct and catchment areas. And so if we're sending a patient to the ED, uh, we can actually just contact the JEDI nurses directly through their office phone, um, let them know, hey, we've got a patient coming over from the um, SNF. Uh, you know, the patient fell and they hit their head. I just need a CAT scan and then send them back. And the JEDI nurse will say, sounds good. You know, we've got all written down. She'll see the patient, say, this is the reason why the patient's here. Yes, he's normally A and O zero. Um, you can just send them back. He's at baseline. They just want to make sure that there's nothing going on with his head, um, which has been amazing. Uh, we also have outpatient, inpatient geriatric consults. This is the lovely Dr. Bradley, who is phenomenal. Um, she came to us from Mount Sinai, and she's been amazing in our ambulatory care clinic and in our educational programs. And so that's our glorious purpose, uh, part two, is to create a health system to support seniors aging in place. And so thank you very much for listening to me and I hope you enjoy the day. I enjoyed hanging out with you guys. Um, so thank you so much. Any questions? Terrific. Thanks so much, Lee. Um, what you've done at Northwestern, truly impressive, really, really inspiring. Um, I have a question uh, here in the chat about uh, the, um, plan your uh, your lifespan website and materials do they come in different languages no would you believe i asked to i put in a grant to have it translated to spanish um and at the time the nih was not into it um i did not get funding so if anyone wants to give me funding to translate i would be happy to do it um yeah i you know i laughed because it was all before a lot of the diversity movement that we've had most recently and the argument that the reviewers gave me is, you know, are you going to look for a grant every time you need a new language? Um, and I'm like, well, Spanish is kind of a big language, you know, like I'm not asking for a really, you know, minute population. Um, but yeah, they didn't see the need to have it translated into Spanish or um, in a cultural version, um, because there is definitely a need uh, in other cultures. Great. Um, there's also a question about the negotiation trainings. Are those in different languages? No, they are not. Um, the main reason is that we just don't have the capabilities right now. 
Um, this is the first time anyone has tried teaching negotiations um, to healthcare professionals or to family caregivers um, through an AI base. Um, it may be doable um, down the road um, as far as translating it, um, but right now we're just concentrating on the English version. I think it's really, I, I think both um, helping hospitalists in negotiation as well as the caregivers in negotiation, that's just brilliant. Um, yeah, so. No, thank I mean, you for that. Yeah, because I mean, how many times, and I, you know, we've all yelled at people and been like, even among colleagues in the hospital, you know, we've all been involved in conflict. Um, and one of the best quotes was like, one of the hospitals said, like, being on the wards is like going to war at times, because you either have to advocate for the patient or get the patient to understand that they need to do something. Um, so there's so much conflict that the hospitalists and the social workers and the case managers and the nurses were like incredibly receptive because they said, now I've got tools that can make it easier. Um, and they were so much more empowered taking the training. So we were jazzed. You know, I mean, I get a lot of people really want to learn, how do I better negotiate? You know, there it, a lot of the things are hours long or how do you sort of distill is this from your sort of MBA training or like what how did you sort of decide you know here's here are the skills that are sort of essential and what is it and, and what's the format for like the hospitalist is it like role playing or I'm always interested yeah. in how you teach negotiation yeah so I'll tell you for the hospitalists and for the social workers when we do it in person we do about a 45 minutes uh 30 about 35 to 45 minutes um lecture where we go through examples of what to do and like tactics. Everybody loves the tactics parts because there's definitely ways of reframing things. Um, you know, for instance, instead of saying you need a homemaker or you need a caregiver, you know, I'm going to set you up with, um, you know, a chef. I'm going to set you up with somebody who can drive you around. I'm going to set you up with an assistant. You can have a personal assistant at home um, instead of saying you need a caregiver. Um, so we went through examples. We went through tactics and then we gave them um, about eight minutes. Um, to negotiate. And we picked like eight minutes. Sometimes we go 10 minutes um, because if you think about how long you have with a patient, it's usually less than 15 minutes. Um, and so that's why we gave them a short amount of time to practice in, in dyads where the hospice would negotiate with another hospice who was pretending to be a patient. Um, and then we broke them out into, you need to get them to agree to have home support. You have to agree um, to have them go to a subacute rehab um, with that mentality, doing it in person, it wasn't easy to disseminate. And so that's why we were more excited about doing it online. Uh, we had Plan Your Lifespan, which was killing it as far as dissemination. So we thought, you know what, they're doing this AI-based stuff in some of the, in some of the business schools. Um, you know, they were doing it at Harvard or at Wharton. I think they were even doing it at Kellogg at the time. And so we were like, you know what, let's try doing it for us. Um, and it is so cutting edge. I am just so jazzed. Every time I get shown it, I'm just like, oh my God. Um, and as like a, as like a little gamer in me, you know, I, I'm always jazzed when I'm like, oh my God, this is so much fun. Cause you want to try to win. Um, and there's this, I want to beat this person. So there's scales that say you're doing good. Um, but we really had to start almost from scratch. We had the framework from the business schools we had some of their lectures, but then we had to kind of adapt it. Um, and I was so lucky because um, the head of negotiations at Northwestern, um, the one who started all in like 1972, um, her name is Jean Brett. Um, she's one of the co-authors on like um, how to say no, um, which you, everyone knows that book, you know what I mean? So, or how to say yes, um, she's on the co-author, but um, she's been negotiating for like 30 plus 40 years um, she's done like all the high powered sports negotiations, like country negotiations, you know, for the UN. Um, and she's like, I would love to do this project. She's like, this is so worthwhile because she had to do negotiations with her mother. Um, and so we got her at such a low rate and I'm like, I need to pay you more. And she's like, this is a hobby for me. And I'm like, your jaw drops because you're like, okay, my grant's going to go out the window because you're going to charge me a lot. And she's like, no. So, I mean, we're paying her next to nothing for what she's doing for us. So it just goes to show you that having good relationships, and one of the things too is just cold calling people and having good relationships with people goes so far in research. So thumbs up, be nice to people, right, Louise? Or Dr. Absolutely. Walton? 
Absolutely. And actually, that feeds in well to the next question that just came in, uh, congratulating you on just terrific work. Are there limitations to the business negotiation model? For example, from the palliative care, you know, I've learned the importance of attention to emotion. And many decisions about where to live are highly emotional. And, you know, how is that, you know, the part of getting past no negotiating style, how is that applicable or how much did you have to adjust? Yeah, the fun, um, well, the fun thing is, is that with most negotiations in the business world, there's a finite end, hmm. um, which is, you know, I want this deal, you know, so there's what we call like a, a negotiated agreement. Um, but with seniors and the whole geriatrics, you know, accepting help, there's so many layers to it so that there's no end. So is it, and we were talking about it, like driving is one of the, is an easier one because you have to stop driving or you drive. It's like being pregnant. You're either driving, not driving. Um, but with getting help in the home, you know, is it for eight hours? Is it for four hours? Is it for 12 hours? Do you need two people to help you out of bed? What if you move to a skilled nursing? What if you move to independent living? So there's all these layers um, that we have to account for when you're negotiating. So we've had to do multiple goal negotiations, which is not a common thing that they do in business. They do more of a package as opposed to a stepladder deal. Um, but yeah, it is, I'm learning how to negotiate better even through this project. I think one of my favorite quotes uh, from our ne negotiation person, she says, the more you negotiate, the better you get. Um, so I always tell people like my residents and my fellows, like here's the training because I've taught our fellows and I've taught our residents because who wants to yell at patients? Um, and I tell them, you know, go home, negotiate with your loved ones, negotiate when you're doing your rent, negotiate, you know, at the rental car aisle, you know, anytime you have the opportunity, don't be afraid and try to get away from that avoiding. So it just becomes a normal process for you in communicating. I think that's wonderful. I mean, are there examples of words to say? I'm always thinking, you know, that was always very helpful as I was learning communication around palliative medicine about I wish statements or, you know, just thinking of the person you gave an example of who said, well, I'm just going to live at home alone until I die in bed. And that's, you know, my decision. Like, what are, how do you, you know, what are some terms or words that you would use to kind of start the conversation in a way that, yeah, that might be effective. Yeah, and you know, I mean, so I use, I mean, for, for us, we usually start off with the idea of, you know, where do you think your memory is at? Do you think your memory is really good? Do you think your memory, you know, where is your memory? So if they say their memory is perfect and you know, their, you know, mocha is not the best, but if they know, if they say it's perfect, then, you know, you've got a ways to go. Mm -hmm. um, if they say, well, my memory is a little off, which most people respond, you know, I have a few senior moments, so it's not perfect. I know I'm a little off. Um, and then what we tend to do is tend to figure out where is your, you know, at what level will you need support or at how bad will your memory have to be before you accept help? So we consider that your bottom line or your BATNA. And so if you get the person to reveal their BATNA, um, then, you know, well, when I can't do this or I have problems doing that, you know, and you can say things like, what about, you know, if you can draw a clock or if you can't draw a clock, well, yeah, you failed the clock draw, so you do need help. Um, so that's just a fun, short way to do it in clinic. Um, we all have experiences with bottom lines at some point. Um, but the framework, and I apologize for this lengthy answer, um, we talk about um, as part of this project is interests, rights, and power, and trying to pe turn people so that there's a shared interest. Um, so that, you know, I'm interested in you not being in the hospital. You don't want to be in the hospital. Let's figure out a way of keeping you at home so that you're not coming back to the hospital. So it's that shared interest um, that we tend to tell people to head towards. I think that's great. In fact, there's a comment here in the chat that that uh, hope you'll share the negotiation work at an AGS session. <laughs> so, oh, that's so, so sweet. <laughs> that's so, awesome. Um, there's also a question here: Is the adaptive testing based on item response theory? No. Um, um, would you believe that? Um, I don't think so. Um, yep. So the most is a different type of trial that's from a randomized control trial offshoot. Um, the people in Penn do a really nice job explaining it. So go online. Um, the Pennsylvania group is probably the strongest right now on most. This is the same um, level that's a smart trial, which is a sequential adaptive trial. Um, but I, the most trial is a way of kind of optimizing your um, 
your intervention so that you can test it out larger scale. Um, cool. Um, there's another question here about going to the JEDI team. Has your JEDI team been able to incorporate the planyourlifespan.org um, when there's long waits in the emergency department? <laughs> yeah, you know, we have not done that lately. Um, we had been doing it pre-COVID because people would get a card. Um, the tricky part is that plan your lifespan and Dr. Sidori is so much better than me because she was smart to convert hers over to a smartphone version. Mm -hmm. um, and ours is intended to be done on a larger screen um, because there's decrease, there's no scrolling. Um, it's all giant font on black and white because we made it for seniors. Um, and so it's not that accessible through a smartphone, only through an iPad or from a big computer. But um, we've tried it. It's just uh, not intended. Sounds good. There's another one about the health system. So again, congratulating you on just great work. Uh, your health system universe, or where are you looking at next for further integration of geriatrics? And how do you anticipate meeting further needs and requests uh, for geriatric services? Oh, yeah, it's ongoing. I, I, and we all have wish lists, you know, of like, who are we going to hit up this week? I, can, I tend to rotate between the people um, that are higher than me. Um, so with Northwestern, by the way, we're hiring. So I told Dr. Walter, I'll take any of her, any of the, the ones she doesn't want, just come to Northwestern. So the best can stay with Dr. Walter. I'll take the, anybody else, you know, I don't want to steal. Um, but so Northwestern Hospital is located, the Central Hospital is located between Michigan Avenue and Navy Pier. Um, so we're very um, vertical. Um, Northwestern, like many health systems, has gone on to buy hospitals that are an hour north, hour and a half west, two hours west. And then this past year, they bought another hospital health system, Palos Health, which is an hour and a half south. Um, so we've got all the suburbs around. And would you believe there's only one geriatrician up north? And there's no geriatrician in any of the suburbs. Wow. And the thing that was frustrating for me too, is that they're like, oh, we have a ton of geriatricians out here. And I'm like, what, right? You're all like scratching your head. In our area, and I don't know if this happens in your area, but we have many um, community-based docs that are calling themselves geriatricians because mm -hmm. they work with old people. And you're like, no, you don't call yourself a cardiologist because you work with people who have hearts. Mm -hmm. you, there's training. Um, so we actually had to do a little bit of pruning and take people's geriatrician moniker off um, because they were kind of misadvertising. Um, and so, you know, what we're doing next, we're going to, we're tackling the home care first across all three regions. Um, and then we're gonna be working on telehealth. Um, and I've got a good call coming up with Dr. Aronson um, tomorrow about some of the things that you're doing and how we can work together. So if anyone wants to work with me, I always have fun and you guys are a fun bunch. So feel free to shoot me an email. That's terrific. Well, actually that reminds me, I was just, or made me think about what's your catchment areas? I was imagining these purple bikes and like how far is somebody biking during a day for these home visits or anyway, for here with all our hills, that might be an added uh, a barrier, but yeah, I'm just- We're very interested. flat. We're absolutely flat. So we have no hills. Um, and Dwayne, our, um, the NP who's full-time uh, probably goes the farthest. He takes the, well, we actually have a really strong public, or we have a re really strong public um, streets or public um, transit program. So the bikes go on the front of buses, um, and then the bikes will also go on the L trains, and the L trains go all the way up north to Skokie, which is about an hour and a half away, and then they go all the way down south um, to, you know, White Sox Park, um, which is that other you know, baseball team in Chicago. Um, but yeah, so um, one of the nice things is that now that we've um, acquired all these hospital systems, we can actually punt some of the ones that are farther away to, um, help, to home care programs that are closer. Because um, each of them have little fledgling home care programs that um, still need to kind of get up to a level of measurement. Um, that we're hoping to do, because ideally you'd love everybody to be on the same system, everybody on the same outcome measures um, and so forth. Um, but yeah, so that's how we get around is purple bikes. Um, we do, we do Uber, we do, that's the thing. So Dwayne is notorious for going in winter on his bike and the rest of us are like, we will just take a cab, <laughs> dude, like a cab or lift. Um, but yeah, he goes in the winter time and he goes all over the place. And 
he got hit by a, he hit a bus, which I, you know, as a leader, you're just like, oh, oh, you know, explicitive, you know, is this the end of my program? <laughs> Uh, but he actually hit a bus and knocked off their rear view window because he was going too fast. Um, and he was all bruised up. And I went oh, to see him no. in the ER and I'm like, Dwayne, and he's like, oh, I'm fine. He's like, the bus driver was more shaken up. And I'm like, do not go fast. There's no rush. Um, but you can't slow down some seniors. So, you know, he's still biking all over the place. Um, it's fun though. He actually invested in a foldable bike. So the foldable mm -hmm. bikes um, tend to get into the trunks of some of the cars faster mm -hmm. too. Um, so we have a couple non-purple bikes going around. <laughs> That's so fun. And there's a comment here about, you know, biking up hills could be an opportunity for healthy aging. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, skip the Peloton, just bike around. Interesting. I was talking to Mount Sinai up in New York and they bike too. And we we're all like, wait, we all bike. So I think it's more because there's no parking um, downtown. Mm -hmm. So to find a parking place, you're just lucky. Yeah, San Francisco, that's the case too. So interesting. Um, I had another question about sort of planning, you know, planning for your care and how much does it help you figure out like, you know, I'm going to come up with the three facilities that I would want to go to if I'm hospitalized. I've always found it so hard to understand the quality, you know, of these, like, you know, how does your, what, and, you know, how does your website help? Because it's going to be very geographic specific, right? In terms of what facilities are near you, like, does it give you tips for sort of understanding how you understand what quality care looks like? Yeah. And that's that, I would love to do that in like part two um, mm -hmm. iteration, um, just because of the size of the website, we just said, here's nursing home compare um, and link to it. It's okay. crazy how many people don't even know about that website because they'll mm -hmm. ask you, where would you send your dad or where would you send your mom? I'm sure we've all had that question. Um, but, you know, people go on that website and they're like, oh, this is four star. This is three star. Um, and there's even been people that say, you know, what, if if I'm living here, then I'll go to these nursing homes. But then what if I live somewhere else? Like, what if I live with my son or daughter? Um, and so I think the value on that um, site, on that part, is that people recognize where the website is or that this is a publicly available thing that people can see. Um, so I think everyone who does an intervention, there's always the shoulda, woulda, couldas. Um, so like, what's part two iteration? You know, what's the next iteration? Mm -hmm. um, and like, in my mind, I was talking to people, we we bought those Oculus 3D eye, eyewear um, sets. And I'm like, how cool would it be to do like a plan your lifespan with the eyewear um, where you can actually see what it's like to be falling and then having to make a decision and then having to make a decision mm -hmm. where you could walk through it. Um, and then one of my other colleagues loved the idea. So she says, let's look at the Oculus to support seniors that are homebound. Um, so we're having fun with technology. It's just, you know, like you see things on TV and you're like, let's try it out with our seniors, you know. That's really neat. And I guess I have to read this particular question in the chat. Uh, do you think the Cubs and Wilson con? Herreras, sorry, I'm a Giants person, uh, will agree on a long-term contract extension during the offseason. Can so imagine that's, that's very what I'm fun question. And if he <laughs> had Gene Brett or Dr. Brett as his negotiator, um, I'm sure he would reach a really good deal. Um, yeah, because she's done like some crazy, you know, negotiations among the sports people. I'm like, why would you not want um, this negotiator? Um, but yeah, I I think I think next year is the year that the Cubs are going to win another championship. This is all for Ken. Um, Ken is my Cubs fan, uh, you know, West Coast, uh, Rizzo, all the good stuff. So my house, uh, one of our rooms is a shrine to the Cubs. Um, so I have three rooms in my house. So you can tell one whole room is Cubs. So it's fun. Too funny. Well, this will be my last question. And it just actually goes back to your very earliest uh, study about for in case people didn't remember the cruise or about living on a cruise or going on a, like, like a year long cruise versus paying for assisted living. Do you want to sort of talk about what your finding was? Uh, yeah, so I took a master's in public health class um, and I had to do a Markov analysis, which is where you look at two populations and you run them through kind of a model. Um, and I put one uh, a group of population on a cruise ship and I put another population in independent living, assisted living and ran it through um, with different costs. And what we found was that the cost of living on a cruise ship long-term versus the cost of living in you know, independent living, assisted living was the same. Um, and the reason why I pointed that out was because 
the quality of some nursing homes is not that good. And if you think about what you get on a cruise ship versus what you get in assisted living or independent living, I mean, you're treated as a client and as like a, a happy tourist versus, you know, somebody who they don't want to respond to. Um, and so, yeah, that's the one I published. I told the fellows this, I published it. I sent, I, I did it. Um, I sent it over to JAGS and Thomas Yoshikawa um, accepted it without revision as is um, wow. in one week. Um, and it was put in a special edition for the next journal. Um, and then like literally like the next day after it came out, like I got assigned a media team and like I was interviewed for the Wall Street Journal and all these other crazy, you know, I was on NPR a couple of times. So like I've done it. It's, it's fun. It's fun to see your work, your research actually get disseminated to people who use it. So if you guys do research, if you're clinicians, think about doing what you can do to make difference with the research in your life. Um, if you're researchers, think about how you can do it globally. Awesome. I think that's a great way to end. So thank you so very much. I know oh it's been late thank in the you day for you. SF. You guys are awesome. Really appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Take care.